so like you might know that I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit on edge. So I was wondering if you could all just give me a little bit of a hand to feel a little bit calmer. Uh, and the best way that I find to make myself feel calmer when I'm doing these things is to uh, ask, a, ask the audience to, to help me out a little bit. So what I would really like you to do is to find a little bit of space and just, just stand up and we'll do a little bit of an exercise to make us all feel a little bit more relaxed. If you just like shake out your arms a little bit. So uh, what I want you to do is start putting your hand up carefully, right? Don't punch someone in the face. It could be liability thing. <laughs> Will you hand up? Put your hand down. Hand up. Start just, yeah. Congratulations, you're all wind turbines. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Hey, cool. Uh, my biggest fans. <laughs> okay, so uh, this talk is largely about the three ways of DevOps um, and also about some somewhat scary things. Uh, so I was wondering if anyone in the audience has a vague idea maybe of what this number is. Uh, and I expect you to take part on the webinar as well. <laughs> What do you think it might be? It might be the release of an application into production. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this number is a somewhat scary number, and this is the number which, uh, the number of amount of time that given our current amount of uh, greenhouse gas production that we will hit uh, 1.5 degrees uh, temperature rise. Now, like that all seems a little bit abstract. It felt a bit abstract to me. So um, I, I sort of did a bunch of research for this, and I had a whole bunch of different things that I thought about maybe putting on here. So I had the floods in, in Pakistan. Uh, I thought about doing something super topical and, and putting in the floods that are happening right now in America. Um, I had this all this research about uh, crop failures. Um, so crop failures as that we get as we reach 1.5 and you'll probably experience this as suddenly not being able to afford some of the foods that you like. Um, but that all felt a bit like theoretical, a bit, oh my god. Um, uh, so I, I instead I, I found this. So this diagram here, this, this map, is where we'll be flooded regularly uh, if we hit 1.5 degrees. Um, can you see your house on there? Kind of scary, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, also our offices will be slightly too warm. That's kind of that's the big one for me. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so, where are all of these greenhouse gases coming from? Like, what are the primary sources? Well, this research here, done by the European Union, um, found pretty solidly that it's coming from the energy industry, which. It's scary. Like, I like my laptop. It uses energy. Um, so who are we? Who, why are we talking about these, these doom and gloom scary things? So my name is Billy Thompson. Uh, I am this tall. Um, uh, I've got curly hair. You may be able to see it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lead consulting engineer at Arma Cooney. And I wanted to give this talk because I think I get it's an excuse for me to talk about some really cool stuff that's happening in the te in the uh, renewables industry, and I get a bit excited and, and go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, my favourite animal is the capybara. If you've not seen one before, you have a Google. Um, yeah. So hi everybody. My name is Claire Puttick. I'm not that tall, and I have straight hair. And I'm a senior product manager at Res. And uh, my background's in physics and astrophysics, but what I like to tell people is I came back down to Earth. And since then, have been uh, enjoying working in roles combining software and renewable energy. And what I do today, day to day now, is I work as a product manager uh, at Res for a product which is called Uno, which is our support services digital platform. So I think I'm just going to spend just one minute telling you about what Res is, because you probably haven't heard of us. We're the world's largest independent renewable energy company, and we work across all aspects of the renewable energy project lifecycle, so from development through to construction and then operating and managing assets on behalf of our customers, which is what we call support services. And we work with um, you know, all the main renewable energy technologies, so wind, solar storage, transmission and distribution, and then also quite uh, recently and quite excitingly, green hydrogen. 
And where I work is in our group technical, and what we do amongst other things is we design innovative software tools for the rest of the business. And the particular area that I'm in is support services. So we're building digital products to help people who manage renewable energy projects in the best way possible. So this talk is all around you know, leveling up our pipelines and you know, why, why do we want to do this? So as an energy sector, there's massive changes happening at the minute, and that's due to a number of different things. And the crisis in Ukraine and COVID has really shone a spotlight on the next big global challenge, which is climate change. And what we know is that to achieve net zero, um, fossil fuel plants need to close. It's just a matter of time. And what this means is that there's a massive gap for renewable energy to fill. And by 2030, 50% of the world's power will come from renewable energy. And as someone who works at a renewable energy company, this is really exciting, this is great, this is great for our business. But it's also um, not without its challenges. So in terms of what a few of those challenges are, there's first of all just more projects that have to manage. So there's people at RES who are in charge of looking after these wind and solar farms, and they might be looking after 10 at a time now, but they might be doing double, triple that in the next few years. There's also more complex projects, so things like uh, hybrid renewable energy projects, combining solar and wind or wind and storage, which come with their own challenges as well. And then finally, as a renewable energy company, we just need to keep innovating to remain market leaders. So particularly as other companies come in and try and catch up with this growth, um, big oil and gas companies, for example, we need to stay at the forefront of our industry. And the way that RES sees um, us being able to cope with this challenge is by investing our, in our technology and our people. So we've been working with Armacuni over the past year uh, to help us with doing that. I am a consultant. RES is doing the really cool, awesome stuff. So how does AK fit in? So I, I'm going to lean on, um, yeah, like how do you find the capacity for these, this new growth? How do you, like, take an organization, and, and RES is really good, um, uh, that, and, and make it so that it can handle this sort of growth, which is, you know, a lot. Um, so uh, our little mantra has been to help the teams achieve elite status, so kind of in the Dora, uh, Dora Report style. Um, but like, yeah, and, and how we engage with teams is, I don't know if you've seen this before, this is team topologies. Can someone give me like some sort of vibe as to knowledge? Yeah, seeing a few hands popping up, cool. Uh, so uh, we, we tend to use uh, collaboration and facilitation methods of uh, working with teams. So that's like short-lived, go and team, disappear again after causing disaster. Uh, that kind of like style of, of interaction. We don't cause disaster. My boss is here. Um, uh, but yeah, like this talk isn't about Armakuni. Uh, it's actually about me getting really excited about cool stuff that I've done at Rev. Um, so yeah, and yeah. So, what is on the menu for this talk? Uh, so we're going to start off, and we're going to talk about uh, optimizing the pipelines of work in an organisation, and we're going to use uh, a few things to do that. That'll be interesting. Um, uh, and uh, but that's not not enough, right? We need to we need to go a little bit deeper than that. We need to uh, do that weird thing inception. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about, this is the, the bit where I get to talk about the cool, exciting technology that I'm like, ah, about. Um, uh, we talk about wind turbines and how data gets from wind turbines and how uh, like power generation like this is a unique challenge. Um, uh, and then we're going to like do that thing on NCIS, NCIS Miami where they like zoom in on a reflection on someone's eyeglass and then they zoom in on a screw in the, uh, on a license plate. And we're going to focus in a little bit uh, on pipelines. Uh, sorry, wrong sort of pipeline. The pipelines that won't kill the planet. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, in, in summary, we're going to talk about optimizing flow, working with teams, uh, one of the core ways. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, what the data is, where it comes from, how it gets to like a data center. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of a story about using feedback and continuous learning to improve a specific product. Uh, because obviously, like, we're going to talk about this, but you know you don't ever reach a specific state by one big bang. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, how we optimize flow in our teams at Res. And you know, I'm, I'm here talking today, but um, you know, this process involved a lot of my colleagues, and it's still a process that isn't quite complete, so the story for us isn't finished yet. So I think it's always useful to talk about how we used to do things in the past. So at Res and our software teams, we had a single team developing a big monolithic product. 
And this is a product that we use to deal with uh, solar technology, wind technology, storage, and also all aspects of what we're trying to deliver to our customers, which for us is you know, collecting data from renewable energy projects, enriching that data by doing calculations, and then feeding back to our users. And you know, having a big single team working on this product um, you know, served us well for the last 10 years, but um, there's also a number of disadvantages to the way that we were doing things in the past. So I think, first of all, we were always dealing with a very large mix of requests because our product was so big. And it also just meant that the cognitive load on the team was very, very high and responsibilities weren't clear either. So what we did is we took a step back and considered, you know, how can we actually uh, improve our flow so that we can develop uh, software quicker? Because what happened is that our speed of development was starting to stagnate. And in this backdrop of massive growth, this was obviously a big problem. So what we ended up doing with taking this, this step back is we considered, you know, how can we take this monolithic product? How can we take this big team and split it up into its components? And what we ended up with is this kind of diagram here that we've got on the right-hand side and on the slide over there, which is basically just all these orange boxes are um, teams. And what we considered is, you know, how can we set these teams up so that we can deliver value to our customers? So for us, that means that, first of all, we just need to get the basics right. And that, for us, is collecting data from site. So we have a single data acquisition team who's responsible for that. And all the other teams could then build on that by adding value, so that could be, you know, a team focusing on uh, KPI calculations, so key performance indicator calculations for our customers, and then doing cool things like analytics and AI, insight, AI insights and control at the top. And my team, which sits uh, kind of right at the top of this pyramid, we have the responsibility of making all that value visible to our customers all in one place. So I think setting up our teams in this way, we immediately saw a number of advantages from. First of all, it meant that Teams were a lot smaller, which again, if you've read team topologies, is one of kind of the key principles. You want small focused teams. And it meant that people could be real specialists in what they do. Each team could also choose which technologies they wanted to work with. So for us, it meant that you know, if you're doing data acquisition, you might be using a different technology stack to people doing uh, analytics and AI insights. And the responsibilities between each of the teams was also a lot more clear. And that meant we could develop software a lot quicker. So a couple of other things to mention is that we also considered um, how we could provide kind of platform functionality to the different product teams. So this became one of the responsibilities of Uno. And what this means is that we can focus on you know, answering difficult questions like how do we do multi-tenant authentication and only doing that once and giving, um, you know, supporting the other product teams and being able to use that functionality so they can develop more quickly. And then finally, we also zoomed in at the interface between the different teams. And the way that we did this was using um, API <coughs> interfaces, which I think has been uh, really beneficial because it means there's very clear uh, interfaces between the different product teams. And it also meant that we got into the habit of treating each other's product teams like a customer, which in turn our other customers benefited from. So a few reflections from my side. I think, first of all, I'd say that this whole process has been very challenging. Um, you know, doing something disruptive, like restructuring teams, is very difficult when you've got business as usual software to maintain. And one of the key challenges that we've come up against is just that there's many, many different ways to split the monolith. And we've taken you know, steps in the wrong direction, had to come back. But overall, it's meant that we've ended up with smaller products that give us the ability to build faster and better. And then a couple of other points, I think um, you know, building quality into the software has been really key to the success of this process. And then on a more personal note, I think um, you know, you, you'll probably all, already all know this, but um, to me, DevOps was all around you know, tools and processes when I, when I first went into this experience. And it's been a real learning for me to understand that you know, DevOps is also about culture. And one thing we've really had to do for this experience is make sure that we make the time to share knowledge between the different product teams and embed this culture of continuous learning. I thought it would be really cool to uh, take that awesome diagram uh, and uh, completely change it. Uh, so uh, I'm a really big fan of Teams Apologies at the moment. I think it's a really nice way of communicating uh, 
how teams could be structured in an effective way to particularly senior leadership. I've shown we've all been in the situation where uh, our boss has fucked it up and we, they've set up all the teams wrong and everyone's constantly you know, doing the triangle where you go to another team, then to another team, then to another team. Uh, so this is what that looks like. Uh, so we have a platform team. Uh, normally these are at the bottom before Ben heckles me and says it should be at the bottom. Um, uh, and we have uh, data acquisition, uh, which is a flow aligned team. And then we have like each of the individual systems systems providing clear, usable, low cognitive load API interfaces to one another. So uh, there, let me explain what a flow aligned team is. A flow aligned team is uh, a team which is aligned to a specific stream of value and work. So uh, they are free to experiment, learn, understand in their domain and iterate on what they are doing. So that is why that sort of structure where you're stratifying and you're uh, identifying a fracture plane along the specific teams to, that will allow you to minimize the amount of cognitive load that each team has and maximize the sort of autonomy that they can choose, like having different technology stacks, for example. Okay, so the thing that I want you to take away from this is that you should align your teams for flow. Radical, I know. Um, uh, and lower the cognitive overhead uh, that your teams have, and also uh, make sure that you, if you're in an organization, you might want to consider using the style of uh, data pyramid. If you have these sorts of co dependencies where you're gathering data, then doing some sort of analysis on it. It's quite a nice structure. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, okay, so we talked about teams. Let's talk about some data. Uh, and let's talk about the pipeline of data. So uh, when we talk about these things, uh, uh, I mostly am going to talk about uh, these ones, little spinny boys. Um, uh, and uh, these are my favorite uh, ones to talk about because I, I know most about them. Uh, and when we think about these, uh, I like to imagine these as like a single thing, like a a monolith or whatever in the sky, um, but actually uh, it's a bit of a lie. They're actually made up of loads of distributed individual components, each of which gives us really interesting information. So uh, we've got these things. A little bit of a secret is these things are the things that always break. This is a gearbox, so direct drive. Um, uh, and what we can do with this is we can put sensors on it, we can measure how hot it is, we can measure how fast it's turning, Interesting stuff, not that exciting, but interesting stuff. You can use it to work out and prevent things from breaking down. That's really cool, I think. Uh, we also have these things. This is, uh, is this from a, a battery plant? It's from a battery plant, yeah. This is from a battery plant rather than a wind turbine. Um, but uh, imagine this was for a wind turbine. It's a control center. We can uh, do some things like we can look at the sort of data that is coming out of that. Um, wind turbines will generate events and alerts and information about like their status from their inbuilt kind of software and stuff. So that's kind of cool. But now we get to the good stuff. I have these things. This here is a sonic anemometer. What it does is you have these kind of four prongs and two of these prongs are capable of emitting like a little sound packet. And then what happens is that you measure the time that that sound packet takes to cross over to the opposite prong and from that you can work out wind speed pretty accurately. Oh, so cool. And they look cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have these things. Oh, tell yeah, me about yeah. this. So, so these are LIDARs, and what they do is they can also measure wind speed amongst some other things. Uh, they use lasers to do that, so they send like a sort of laser beam out into the front, and then it hits off certain particles and aerosols and comes back, and then from that you can also work out wind speed. And they're small enough that you can put them on the top of wind turbines. Yeah, so cool. The building wind turbine, building, putting freaking laser beams on the top of them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, and the, the thing that I really like about these is you can use them and you can fire them behind a, uh, a wind turbine. You can see how like choppy the air is, so you can like adjust them so that you can get out of a field of wind turbines. You can get the most out of all of the wind turbines. How cool is that? Uh, I think it's awesome. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that I the reason that I'm telling you about this stuff, other than it's an excuse for me to talk about, because I think it's really cool, um, uh, is this. So if you imagine a wind turbine. Uh, not many of them are like near a data center or near someone's house or, you know, they're generally in the middle of uh, nowhere. Uh, um, uh, so, oh no, this is a disaster. Let me tab that out. There we go. No one notice, it's fine. Um, uh, so these are quite like remote devices and sometimes they're connected with Wi-Fi. Sometimes you're lucky enough to get a bit of an internet connection there. But actually, we can do 
continuous deployment to these. We can do continuous delivery to these. Um, these little, uh, with these wind turbines all have little boxes that sit inside them, and you can do uh, data gathering, and you can deploy little Docker containers using, well, we use uh, Azure Edge and IoT, uh, and we deploy some C Sharp code to them, and you can get this cool information, so you can do live updates. So even for like things which are in the fields in the middle of nowhere, you can DevOps it, <laughs> uh, which I, I get such a kick out of. Yeah. So the thing I want you to take away from this little bit is, <laughs> Laser beams are cool. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> physical tricky systems can use continuous delivery. Even if you've got a system which you think, oh, we can't do that, it's going to be too hard. I bet you can. I bet you can. <laughs> um, uh, and you can get those benefits like without having to have someone, you know, a Gary to drive out with his pen drive and plug it into the thing. Uh, yeah, so we've talked about uh, how the data gets there. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. How do you reckon? <laughs> it's fine. Fine. Oh, loads of time. Um, so, uh, pipelines. So, the one thing I want to talk to you now is this idea. So, we've, we've looked at, like, the broad team structure. We've looked at, like, the, how the data gets in in a sort of general sense. And now we're going to zoom in and we're going to talk about a specific experience of using feedback to inform our, like, software delivery process in order to reach that structure we talked at the start. Because we didn't start there. We, this is, a, like, an end state. It's like, you know, Blue Peter. Okay, so uh, when I first, it's like a year ago or something, uh, when I first came to uh, partner with Rez for a bit, uh, I've, I've had the fortune to work in loads of cool teams in Rez, um, uh, but the first one that we worked in uh, was Wind, um, and uh, I had this description of uh, all the analytics, and to me it was sort of described, in fact, do you want to tell them uh, what, which one of these analytics might be interesting. Yeah, so we've got an analytic at Res, uh, which in the past we've called MITE, but probably is better called the Turbine Performance Indicator. And what this is is basically a measure of how effectively a turbine is converting you know, wind into electricity. So the higher the value, the better it's doing. Yeah. So, uh, I, so w I, uh, we did a little bit of a requirements gathering session. We all like, uh, we did a little bit of event storming, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and uh, we, we had this description of what the analytics were looking like. Um, so, uh, and if you're like me, you looked at this and said, ah, it's a dot, it's a dag, um, uh, which is a directed acyclic graph, not a dog said with a funny accent. Um, so, uh, so what, what do you do if you have a dag? Well, you use a dag running tool for running your dags. Uh, and we use Dagster, and I'm going to say the word dag a lot, apparently. Um, uh, and this lived in Kubernetes. Um, it's still lives in Kubernetes. Uh, there's some supporting APIs that live inside the, the Kubernetes, the little, uh, and there's some ones that live in serverless land. Uh, you can do quite a lot with different stacks. But we, we were quite proud of this. We went to uh, a demo. Uh, this is a demo. Um, green is good, by the way. Um, uh, so we went to a demo, and we were chatting to our customers. And our customers were like, huh. Oh, that's really cool. I want to try this out. I want to play with the, uh, the uh, analytic that you've built there. I need to fire in some data, do a bit of experimentation, play with it a little bit, learn about it. And we were like, oh, actually, that's, that's quite hard. It's, it's inside this whole complicated uh, DAG system. We want it to be like, and they want it to be simple and just to fire in some data. So we're like, oh, crap. Oh, crap. Uh, so we did this, which is we removed the DAGster. And we replaced it with little packets being passed in queues between the individual services. But it meant that each of our services then could have a cool little API that we can use. Great, awesome, running in serverless land. Uh, but uh, like, and over time, this, this sort of matured. Um, uh, but we were kind of, kind of. Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, this is. Uh, we then. So we after a little while, we we every week we do a retro. And in one of these retros. Uh, and this is my favorite retro template, by the way. Is it really a retro if you've not decorated the starfish? Uh, I don't think so. Um, anything that involves drawing, gotta, gotta love it. Um, maybe I should have been an artist. Uh, anyway, uh, so we were sitting in our, in our retro, uh, and we were talking about how hard and how painful it was to maintain all these small microservices, all these small like functions. Uh, and we're like, oh crap, how can we how can we solve this? So we did what all good software development teams do. We looked at the classics. Uh, Alexander the Great, noted software developer. Uh, and uh, so we were like, oh, 
Right, so Alexander the Great, if you don't know, there's a story about Alexander the Great that he uh, went into a city. The city had a, had a prophecy that um, if you had a... Uh, if that the person who cut... The, how, who untied the... Uh, a cart which was tied to a pillar in the city and rode in would become the king of that city. And Alexander the Great, being a charming man and not at all a bit of a cheater maybe, uh, came in with his knife and was like uh, and just cut through the Gordian knot. Uh, so we were like, okay, maybe we can be like Alexander the Great. So rather than having a complicated series of cues together, what we did was we actually sidestepped the problem. We in instead simplified our architecture we made a split between two of our teams, and we made a set of core uh, analytics that would then be depended on by all the others. So we're removing and sidestepping all of that complexity that is brought by the, uh, by the necess necessity of having all the pipes and just making something simple that has a nice, simple API that we can just interact with. So we're sidestepping, cutting through the Gordian knot of complexity. So. This is the story, a little bit of the story, of how we found one of our fracture planes. I want you to think about when you are discovering the fracture planes in your organization, uh, how you can use that to, how you can identify and sidestep complexity to reduce cognitive load within your teams. Um, and most importantly, I want you to listen to people. Listen to yourselves, learn from inside, learn from outside, talk to your users. Um, apparently they have needs, found out that yesterday. Um, yeah, so, in conclusion, organize your teams for low cognitive load and flow. Even really tricky, complicated environments can use continuous delivery, continuous deployment. Um, and get feedback early, get feedback often. And I think that's all, did you wanna? Yeah. I also just wanted to put this up here. So this is Res's mission, a future where everyone has access to affordable zero carbon energy. And you know, when you read the news these days, this can seem very, very far away. But yeah, with renewables, it's possible. So I just wanted to put that up there. And thank you for listening. Because we had all doom and gloom at the start. So yeah. There's hope, right? We can do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.